them, hey, come, we're doing a whole series on, on God and money. Uh, it should be very helpful because we're going to hit the holistic part of uh, life and everything. Amen? <laughs> Amen. All right, cool deal. So this will be our last week in this series. Uh, prayerfully, it's been a blessing to you and it's been uh, helpful to you. Um, I pray I won't get in trouble today. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. Okay, so uh, we're going to do a hodgepodge. I'm going to be honest with you. I say this every week. I, I really don't know if we can get through a lot of these. I only have four key things we're going to walk through. We're going to look at some what we would call urban legends, things that we hear about, uh, but we're going to talk about are they really found in the scripture? Are they there? Uh, some of the things we're going to talk about are going to be very like, oh, it's very minute, but then it's almost like, hey, you know, we want to um, look at these and just make sure we're being people of the book and stuff like that. So we're going to cover four key areas, okay? Are right, y'all ready for them? Should I give them to y'all front or should we just walk through them? I give them to y'all front so that way you can be prepared. All right, we're going to look at number one, was Jesus a carpenter? We're going to look at that, was Jesus a carpenter? Uh, we're going to look at our holidays, are they pagan? Should we celebrate them? We're going to look at that. Um, then we're also going to look at um, does a scripture teach that Christians are commanded to tithe? We're going to look at that. And then uh, the last one we're going to look at um, is Revela- Revelation 3, 14, 18. Uh, God would rather you cold toward him than lukewarm. So we're going to look at that as well. And uh, we'll see kind of where we end up uh, after that. All right. Is that good? Is that helpful? Okay. All right. All hot button stuff. Okay. All right, so let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to once again gather. Uh, thank you for these, your people, Lord, uh, God, that you love and care for, Lord. Um, I pray that you would be with us, God, as we uh, talk through these uh, certain topics, Lord, that uh, we will be both challenged and edified to live in a way that you get the glory and uh, you get the glory in our lives, God, through our generosity, uh, through our understanding of the word, and also for us as a church actually being life-giving and living uh, for your glory, God, as the scripture teaches in Revelation, Lord. So, God, I thank you for this. It's, uh, we give you all the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's look at number one, was Jesus a carpenter? So in Mark 6, 3, uh, it says this, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, uh, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Uh, aren't, and aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. We also find the scripture calling Jesus a carpenter in other places. Matthew 13, 55, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So in the first century, a son would typically follow in the profession of his father. So Joseph, being a carpenter, would most likely have taught his son carpentry. Now, all major translations agree, but when we look at the uh, really ancient translations, such as the Latin Vulgate, uh, completed in about AD 40, it refers to Jesus as what we call a faber, meaning a craftsman or artisan. Okay, so you look at the earlier translations, it really lays out that Jesus was a craftsman or artisan. So this is a more general term incorporating many different disciplines, not just carpentry. In fact, the Wessex Gospels, uh, their old English translation before the year 1000, it said Jesus was a smith, uh, meaning one who works with metal. Now, the Tyndale uh, New Testament, which was completed in 1526, he's called a carpenter. So what's happened is pretty much every translation of the Bible since that one, since the Tyndale New Testament, uh, has followed just using that translation in any common English Bible. That, hey, Jesus, here he is, the carpenter, son of, you know, Mary, and that kind of thing, right? Uh, So before that, there was much disagreement on using the the phrase carpenter. But really, if we want to get to the bottom of it, we just need to go to the Greek. That's all we need to do, right? So in the Greek is the word carpenter. It's the word tecton, all right? The word tecton. And, And in fact, if you go to uh, the Greek English lexicon, uh, and we look at uh, one of the, the most scholarly uh, lexicons, the Love, uh, et, uh, Love uh, lexicon, it says this, one who uses various materials, wood, stone, and metal in building, a uh, builder, a carpenter, uh, and, and it goes on talking about Matthew 13, 55. Uh, and so anyone who is regarded as a tecton would be skilled in the use of wood, stone, and even possibly metal, 
All right. So we look at the Greek that tells us right there what it is. So the best way to study this word is to look at look at it the way people use it in the first century and how they described it. So the ancient uses of tecton reveal several instances where this word was used to describe someone working only with wood. So uh, one um, one historian uh, or one or really you look all the way back to 8035 say this. Uh, it said this man is a carpenter because he used an axe. Uh, Plutarch, who died in about 8020, said, and so a tecton would regard the welding of iron or the tempering of an axe. So a tecton in this writing referred to a smith, somebody who's working with metal. Uh, Philo, a first century Hellenistic Jewish man living in Alexandria, used the word in a manner consistent with the idea of a carpenter, but none of the words refer to only carpentry. So the last one, we look at Josephus, who is an ancient Jewish historian. He writes of a tecton as a builder who worked with various metals and wood. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, in Exodus 35, 30 through 35, it says this. Moses then said to the Israelites, look, the Lord has appointed by name be- uh, Beeziel, son of Uri, son of Ur, the, of the tribe of Judah. He has filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and the ability in every kind of craft to design artistic works in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut gemstones for mounting, and to carve wood for work in every kind of artistic craft. And he goes on to talk about all the abilities that God gave these folks to help build that that first uh, makeshift temple uh, to the glory of God. So Bible scholar Ken Campbell concluded that the Israelite builder did not limit himself to the working with only one material. He can move from metal to wood as the need or opportunity arose. So to summarize, a tecton was someone who worked with uh, stone, wood, and metal. So Jesus did carpentry, but he also most likely was a mason and a smith. Uh, The phrase used today for an ancient tecton is a general contractor or builder. I think about this. I go to prepare a place for you, right? I mean, all these kind of things, right? We see all the ancient sources really when we look at this want to specify when someone was a smith, they would just say he was a builder in metal. When they wanted to say someone was a carpenter, they would just say he was a builder of wood. But if you go look back at Matthew and Mark, and you look at what it talks about Jesus in relation to this, uh, they never really specialized that he said, you know, look, he has working with one material. So we shouldn't add that specialization either. Now, does this really, you say, man, does this really matter in anything? Well, in the grand scheme of things, no, it doesn't change who Jesus is, it doesn't change that who he is as a son of God. But if we want to be honest and be uh, really factual in people of the book, we want to say, yeah, we want to have a full understanding of these things, uh, even as people come to us and say different things. So Joseph and Jesus were probably builders in the general sense and not specifically carpenters. So it is true Jesus was more than a carpenter <laughs> in more ways than one, right? Right. So here he was, more than a carpenter. We see in that Greek word there, tecton, he was a general builder. And that's awesome, right? That's a good fact to know uh, to the glory of God. I only use that to warm you up for what I'm about to talk about next. Okay, holidays are pagan, so we shouldn't celebrate. Can anyone name for me a Jewish holiday that is celebrated in the Old and New Testament that was not commanded by God But the Jewish folks, you know, created it and celebrated it. And he's even talking about Jesus celebrating too. Hanukkah, yes. Come on. I went to, growing up, I was at a, how would you put it? Uh, Jewish school. There you go. The only black girl in the whole school. Wow. I'm like, if I had to learn about Hanukkah one more time. Man, Savannah with the facts on the day, man. (laughs) We had to learn how to cook them. Wow. Wow. All right. There you go. Wow. Like, I'm like, I'm well, you own it, man. That's exactly right. So, yes, we see two holidays, actually, Hanukkah being one of them. Purim or Purim is another one. And so I'm going to talk about two of these, right? So Purim is the Jewish festival commemorating the deliverance of the Jews in Persia from Haman's plot. We see that in Esther 9, 26 to 30. And we see the Jews celebrating that 
after that. Uh, but also we see uh, the reality of Hanukkah as well, just as Savannah was saying too. So this eight-day feast of dedication or feast of light celebrating the recon- reconsecration of the temple in Jerusalem in 165 or 164 BC. So Hanukkah is the only major Jewish festival that does not originate in the Hebrew Bible. It commemorates an event described outside the Bible, but outlined extensively in what we will find, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Otherwise, Hanukkah is mentioned only once in the New Testament, uh, in John 10, 22, when Jesus visits Jerusalem. So Hanukkah begins on the 25th of the month of Kislev, November or December, and includes important rituals with lights, branches, and all the things that come with it. Now, the reason why I bring that up is that, one, we see a precedent already with things in uh, the text that are holidays that are celebrated that uh, God didn't necessarily command uh, everyone to uh, celebrate, but the Jewish people did do that. So the first thing I'm going to look at before we look at Christmas is Easter. Easter is always the one that comes up and people just lose their minds. And here's the thing. I'm going to look at Romans as well that uh, shows us how uh, even when we're supposed to really have patience with the weaker brother, but also uh, the stronger uh, brother in the Lord should help the weaker Christian as well. Uh, And that there's things that we uh, have Christian liberty in and that we have to be mature in. And so we're going to talk about that for a second. All right. So the question would come up then, well, isn't Easter pagan? So then we shouldn't have anything to do with it. Uh, we see this every year. Uh, many people say, well, no, I'm not going to say Easter. It's going to say Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to do that. And all those things, that's fine. You want to say Resurrection Sunday, praise God or whatever. But we have to be, you know, factual if we're going to be factual, all right? These are one of those things that you can find a, a, a hodgepodge or a conglomerate of information that sometimes muddies the waters and doesn't clear the waters. And so you want to go to first and primary sources to really find out, okay, what is true, what's not true, and then we want to talk about some of that. Well, here's the thing. My, my good brother, uh, Damon Richardson uh, at Urban Logia, he has these four points, and I want to just outline them really quickly, and we don't even have time to go through each one. Uh, well, one of the things we have to see is that if we look at history, there, there's uh, nothing that supports the idea Uh, that this was pagan. And so, in fact, what we find is that the Christians Christians celebrated uh, the idea of Easter or the resurrection of our our Lord, and we'll look at that in a second, uh, around 165 A.D., And so we have evidence that this was a common practice among even first century believers. Now, they called it, the festival called it Pascha, right? So this Greek word for Passover, where they celebrated not necessarily the Passover as in Exodus, but they celebrated the fulfillment being found in Jesus Christ, that Jesus was and is the fulfillment of that Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 lays it out for us. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So where do some of these things come from? Well, Easter as pagan comes from, as one uh, historian put it, uh, in antiquity from an 8th century monk named Venerable Bede, who stated that Easter Monath was named after the goddess Easter. However, English professor Ronald Hutton of the University of Bristol, who specializes in pagan religion in early Britain, he stated in his book, Pagan Britain and Pagan Religion in the British Isles, that outside of the monk, Venerable Bede, there's no historical evidence uh, uh, no historical evidence of the worship of a fertility goddess named Istor among the Anglo-Saxon people and no evidence of pre-Christian pagan festivals in the month of March or April. Well, where do we get some of this stuff from? Well, if we go into history and we look at Charlemagne or Charlemagne or Charles the Great, uh, Charlemagne Charles the Great was the king of the Franks and he was really classified as the Christian emperor of the West. Now, he did much to shape the character of medieval Europe. He actually presided over the uh, uh, the Renaissance in that area. And Charlemagne spent the early part of his reign on several military campaigns for one purpose. He wanted to expand his kingdom. So he invaded then, which was Saxony in 772, and he eventually achieved total conquest. And part of that was converting, uh, converting people and the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons, to Christianity. So when that happened, Charlemagne had all these reforms. He changed how they handled money. He changed uh, the standardizing of weights. He changed their legal structure, all that kind of stuff. And he also attempted to consolidate Christianity throughout the entire Saxon empire. 
So he persuaded many eminent scholars to come to his court to establish a new library for Christians. In fact, even before Charlemagne the Great, St. Augustine went to the Anglo-Saxons, many before that to try to preach the gospel to them as history tells us that. But what we find is that there's no scholarly source that shows any month of the Saxon calendar named after a goddess for worship. So early Christians named March Easter Monath because based on the time of the year where they would celebrate the Pascha or the Passover. So we see this coming right there. Now, again, there was no goddess in store or fertility deities worshipped in Britain. So where did this come from? Well, this is what you hear all the time. And this is why you got to be careful is because remember, if someone's coming along and saying, see, Christians are pagan, and then you're saying, yeah, we are pagan, you're really shooting your own self in the foot. Because essentially you're agreeing with those who are saying, oh, we're practicing, practicing pagan practices. Well, are we? Well, I don't know. Let's see. So one of the things that comes up often is that, well, because in Babylon there was a goddess named Ishtar, and you're saying Easter is the same. You guys ever heard of a homophone before? It's, it's a word that sounds the same, but does not have the same meaning. This is very, it sounds the same, similar sounds, but no relationship between the two. Easter in itself, if you look at the meaning of the word, means opening. Is star means chief ones. Sounds the same. It's not the same. So Easter, in a short summary, is named after a time of the month, or March or April, the beginning of spring, when converted Anglo-Saxons celebrated the Passover uh, of Christ being the fulfilled Passover lamb. In fact, if you look at one uh, historical sor- source, it says this, the feast of Easter came to be observed. So this is in the first century. Came to be observed in each place according to the individual peculiarities of the peoples insomuch as none of the apostles legislated on this matter. What they were saying is this. Essentially, you had people who had the freedom in Christ who said, you know what, we're going to celebrate this at this time to the glory of God. And there's no ruling from the apostles to say you can or couldn't do it. So the origin, you say, well, what about the origin of the word? Like, I mean, what about that? Well, the origin of a word does not mean the word is bad any more than the origin of technology used by Nazis, such as the jet engine, mean that it's bad. I love what Matt Slick talks about this, right? So if we're to avoid using words, if they have a pagan origin, origin, then we have to be consistent. So that means don't say Jupiter anymore. Jupiter, the ancient Roman god of the heavens and the weather. Mars, the ancient Roman god of war. What about Saturday? Saturday, the day of Saturn, the ancient god of agriculture, hence Saturn Day, which became Saturday. Uh, Saturn, the ancient Roman god of agriculture, we talked about that. Thursday, derived from the ancient word uh, Thurs, Thursdar, which designated the Norse god Thor, which where we get Thor's day. See, words can have pagan organ, origins, but we still use them today, right? So it's not bad to use them, and it doesn't mean that if the word originated even in a pagan context that it's somehow involved in paganism. Therefore, it is okay to use the word Easter because we understand it to mean that time of year when Jesus rose from the dead. But then you say, well, what about the bunnies and the eggs? Well, like all that. Again, we already made the statement when we talk about Easter, we're not talking about bunnies and eggs from the original source where it comes from. They celebrated the Paschal, the Passover lamb, the Jesus who is the fulfillment of all things. Yeah, many of these these traditions that we find with bunnies and eggs uh, came from Germany around the the late 18th century when a flood of German immigrants came to America. So it was a spring festival tradition that coincided with the celebration of Easter, and these things ultimately get conflated, right? And we see that in our culture. It's like, oh, they see eggs and they see all this kind of stuff and say, oh, no, but these things are conflated. This is not what we're talking about. So when we see this reality, right, we're saying, look, it doesn't necessarily have this pagan uh, symbolism like many people make it out to be. But I'm going to get to a second point on this in in a few minutes. So then should we celebrate Christmas then? Well, Christmas is the annual holiday that we have that celebrates the birth of Christ. 
uh, Christmas, of the major Christmas festivals, uh, according to the Holman Bible uh, Dictionary, uh, is the most recent in origin. So the name, uh, uh, contraction of the term Christ Mass, uh, did not come until the Middle Ages. In fact, in the early centuries, Christians were much more likely to celebrate the day of a person's death than even the person's birthday. So very early in its history, the church had an annual observance of the death of Christ and also honored many early Christian martyrs as well on the day of their death. But before the fourth century, churches in the East, Egypt, Asia Minor, and Antioch observed epiphany or this manifestation of God to the world. And we hear that often even in our own culture. Uh, They're celebrating epiphany, right? God coming into the world. Uh, celebrating Christ's baptism, his birth, and the visit of the Magi. So in the early part of the fourth century, Christians in Rome began to celebrate the birth of Christ. So this practice spread widely, rapidly. So most parts of the Christian world observed this new festival by the end of the century. So in the fourth century, the controversy over the nature of Christ, whether he was truly God or created being, led to an increased emphasis on the doctrine of the incarnation, right? The affirmation that the word became flesh, which likely led to the urgency and the proclamation of the incarnation that it was an important factor to spread. And that's what probably led to that spread of the celebration of Christmas so so often we see today. So there's no evidence that remains about the exact date of the birth of Christ. People argue about this all the time, right? They, oh, you know, was it on December 25th? Not, it was in the spring, it was not. Well, the December 25th date was chosen as much for practical reasons as uh, Chad Brand writes in the uh, Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Uh, The December 25th date was chosen as much for practical reasons as for theological ones. Throughout the Roman Empire, various festivals were held in conjunction with the rental solstice, In Rome, the Feast of the Unconquerable Sun celebrated the beginning of the return of the sun. So when Christianity became the religion of the empire, uh, the church either had to suppress the festivals or transform them. The winter solstice seemed an appropriate time to celebrate Christ's birth. Thus, the festival of the sun became the festival of the sun, the light of the world. Well, you say, well, okay, well, what about the Christmas tree? I know the Christmas tree is pagan because the Bible says... Clearly in Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16, we are not supposed to have Christmas trees in our house. I know because they were giving gifts and having Yuletide greetings in Jeremiah. So let's look at Jeremiah. Let's see what it says. So you can see for yourself. And then let's talk about what it's saying there. All right. Jeremiah chapter 10. All right. Verse 1 through 16. Let's read the whole thing. Okay? All right. If you got your Bible, let's read the whole thing. Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16. Remember, you got to be careful. You can never read into the text something from your own culture expression and make it fit in there. You just got to read what the text says, right? Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16. Let's read it. Hear the word that the Lord has spoken to the house, to you, house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them, for the customs of the people are worthless. Someone cuts down a tree from the forest. You say, see, right there. It's at Home Depot. (laughs) It is worked by the hands of of a craftsman with a chisel. Yeah, see, that's the guy with the, you know, the, the, uh, the saw, and he's, he's working it. Is it? Okay, I don't think so. It's worked by the hands of a craftsman with a chisel. He decorates it with silver and gold. It is fashioned with hammer and nails so it won't totter. Does anybody have ever seen anyone do that with a Christmas tree? No. Like scarecrows in a cucumber patch, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, and they cannot do any good. Lord, there is none like you. You are great. Your name is great in power. Who should not fear you, king of the nations? It is what you deserve. For among all the wise people of the nations and among all the kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish, instructed by worthless idols made of wood. What does it say the idol is made out of? Wood. 
Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Upaz. The work of a craftsman and a go- of a goldsmith's hands is clothed in blue and purple, all the work of skilled artisans. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and eternal king. The earth quakes at his wrath and the nations cannot endure his fury. You are to say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He made the earth by his power, established by the word, world by his wisdom, and spread out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens are in turmoil, and he causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for rain and brings the wind from the storehouses. Everyone is stupid and ignorant. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his carved image. For his, for his cast images are alive. There's no breath in them. They are worthless, a work to be mocked. At the time of their punishment, they will be destroyed. Jacob's portion is not like these because he is the one who formed all things. Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of armies is his name. Now, we just read that fully in context. Is it talking about tinsel toe or idols? So it's been claimed that Jeremiah 10, 1 through 6 prohibits the cutting down of and decorating of trees in the same manner as we do at Christmas time. However, reading this, we see this is not what it's talking about. It's setting forth a prohibition against idols made of wood plated with silver and gold and worship. We just read that. A similar idea appears in Isaiah 44, where Isaiah speaks of the silliness of the idol worshipers who cut down a tree burn parts of it in the fire to warm themselves and use the other parts to fashion an idol which they bow down to. So unless we're bound down to Christmas trees, carving it into an idol and pray to it, these passages cannot be applied to Christmas trees. Now, you may be saying, I don't care what you're saying. I ain't doing it. Well, that's the point. No one's forcing you to do anything. That is the whole point, Right? 1 Corinthians 10, 23 tells us this. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. Romans 14, 1 tells us, welcome anyone who's weak in the faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. He goes on to say, Romans 14, 5 through 8, one person judges one day to be more important than the other. Someone else judges another day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. In Romans, they were having this issue where you have folks who are strong in the Lord. And, and if you go back and read Romans 14 in its context, it is the strong brethren that Paul is giving admonition to. And he's saying, look, there are weaker brethren among you. He was not saying to the weaker, given, he was giving the, the admonition to the, the stronger brother to bring up the weaker brother. But helping the stronger brother to understand that, look, your weaker brother, they, they, they're, they're weak in, the, in this aspect, but yet you're strong in it. You understand when you eat food, you're giving glory to God. You're not worrying about idols. You're not worrying about all these things. You're strong in your faith. Trust the Lord. So help your weaker brother out. What does that mean for us? It, among us as Christians, there are going to be different people with different convictions about different things. The bigger point I'm making is this. Just make sure your conviction is based on what's factually right, not what is sensationalized, right? If you don't want to have a Christmas tree in your house, don't do it then, right? But don't look down on your brother or sister in the Lord who does, right? Don't take things that that people have said and been sensationalized and it's not coming from uh, either first century sources or like your primary sources and say, see, this is why we don't do this or see, we're pagans, Well, no, that's not how we're supposed to operate. We want to operate off of what is factual and what is true, right? So these things we have much Christian liberty in, and we should walk in that to the glory of God. If this is something that you feel like in your conscience that you say, I I just can't do it, don't sin against your conscience, right? But don't be going around telling folks, see, you just pagan. It's not true. You just read it in John. You just read it in Jeremiah. It's not true, right? So none of these things are factual. So we want to make sure we're, we're doing that. All right. So here's the next one. Y'all ready for the next one? Okay. 
Are Christians commanded to tithe? Okay, if you've been here for a while and you've been sitting under me for a while, you already know the answer to this. But for some who are new, I would love to just walk through this and help us to get an understanding of what I believe the Scripture teaches, and it teaches from the Old to the New Testament as well, walk through it. Okay, so when we look at Old Testament giving, right, we see really free will, we see sacrificial giving, and we see mandatory giving. We see all these three operating there. If you you say tithe, what does that mean? Well, it's to give a tenth or to take a tenth of or a part of. That's what it acts, that's the actual definition, to give a tenth or take a tenth a part of. So a tenth was a part of the theocratic system of government to support the Levites in that theocratic government. So the theocratic government means God, it's his government, right? And for his people, they had a way and a system in that governance to make sure that the Levitical priests were taken care of. In fact, Numbers 18.21 tells us this. Since Levi could not amass wealth, the tribe was to be supported by the gifts and the tithes. This is what it was meant for. This is why when you go to Malachi, where does it say to bring the tithe to? And who benefited from that? Well, the Levitical priests, right? Those who could not work, right? The interesting thing about the tithe, this was a common practice, not just for Jews, but in many Near East cultures. Most likely coming from the idea of counting ten fingers and that's where it kind of it came from. Also being a number of perfection. We see this all throughout the Bible as well. So where do we find this first kind of mention? So Genesis 14, 18 through 20, right? Genesis 14, 18, to 18 through 20. And uh, I'm going to pull it up real quick. And you can pull up in your Bible so you can see it as well. And hold on. All right. So Genesis 14, 18 through 20. All right, let's read it. It says this, um, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God most high. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abraham gave him a what? Tenth or tithe, right? Abraham gave gave him a tenth of everything. That's going to come into play of what everything, right? Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people, but take the possession for yourself. So Abraham, if you know the story, if you go back to Genesis, uh, Abraham rescues his nephew. In the process of this, he, uh, you know, rescues his nephew Lot. Then he has the spoils of war, right? What is left over from the people he rescues uh, Lot from, right? But these are not of his own increase. These are the spoils of war. Now, Melchizedek, which is going to come into play when we get to Hebrews, he represents a priest of God, right? So Abraham wanted to honor, not necessarily Melchizedek, but he wanted to honor God. Now, think about this. No one told Abraham what to give. Like if you go back to Genesis 13, 12, 11, there's nowhere in there where anyone's telling Abraham what to give. So we see his giving wasn't mandatory at this point. He gave freely of the spoils that he had. He had. So the requirement for giving on the spoils of war in the Mosaic law was actually different because actually in the Mosaic law, there was a a law that talked about how do you give in this way. Now, Numbers 31, 27 through 30 says this. Then divide the captives between the troops who went out to war and the entire community. Set aside a tribute for the Lord for what belonged to the fighting men who went out to war. One out of every 500 people, cattle, donkeys, sheep, and goats. Take the tribute from their half and give it to the priest Eleazar as a contribution to the Lord. From the Israelites, half take one out of every 50 from the people, cattle, donkeys, sheep, and goats, and all livestock, and give them to the Levites who perform the duties of the Lord's tabernacle. Now, Hebrews 7, we see this whole text is mentioned again, right? If you look at Hebrews 7, you can go read it later. You see where it talks about the greatness of Melchizedek, right? Now, remember, you can't just isolate a verse and take it out and then make a whole doctrine out of it. You got to read it in context and say, well, what, what is the author of Hebrews saying? Why in the world would he talk about Melchizedek 
and Abraham. And how does this relate to Jesus? What is he saying in this moment here, right? So look, uh, uh, Hebrews 7. From this Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of God most high, met Abraham. So the same story we just read. And blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning or days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now look at verse 4. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who receive the priestly office have a command, according to the law, to collect a tenth from the people. That is, from their brothers and sisters, though they have also descended from Abraham. Keep reading. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who, who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In one case, men who will die receive a tenth. Who is he talking about there? The Levites. Will die will receive a tenth. But in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, has paid a tenth through Abraham, for he was still with his ancestors when Melchizedek met him. Now, verse 11 is the linchpin. Because up until this point, all he's talking about is what Abraham did with Melchizedek. We're going from the lesser to the greater. And who is the greater? Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis uh, basis of if if the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron. For when there's a change of priesthood, there must be a change of what? There must be a change of what? Must be a change of law as well. For the one of these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served the altar. Now it's evident that our Lord came from Judah and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And he just goes on and on, essentially talking about Melchizedek compared to Jesus. So in Hebrews 7... This is mentioned about what Abraham did, but it's mentioned, but, but contextually, the author of Hebrews was not arguing for the continuation of tithing in the new covenant. Hebrews 7 stands to make the argument that Melchizedek's priesthood was superior over the Levitical priesthood. In fact, Paul Ellingsworth a New Testament scholar stated this, Abram's action is unrelated to the later Mosaic legislation on tithes, and this is not Hebrews 7's concern. Abraham lived 160 years, and at no time in Scripture is it ever recorded before or after this incident that he ever gave a tenth again. This is the only time that he ever gave a tenth that we know of in a record of 160 years on earth. So Jacob, we see in Genesis 28, 22, and if I return safely to my father, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. Now, Jacob desired to barter with God, right, in this moment. What we see in the Old Testament as well, we see giving freely. We see the reality of Cain and Abel. We see Noah giving freely. We see Abraham giving freely. We even see Moses and the people in Exodus 25 giving freely to the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses in Exodus 25, 1 and 2, tell the Israelites, take an offering for me. You are to take my offering from everyone who's willing to give. Then it goes on to say, then the entire Israelite community left Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart was moved and whose spirit prompted him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its services and for the holy garments. Now, Exodus 36, 6 and 7. After Moses gave an order, they sent a proclamation through the camp, let no man or woman make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. So the people stopped. The materials were sufficient for them to do all the work. There was more than enough. In the Old Testament, there's not just one tithe. There's multiple. There's three separate tithes. Where are they? Well, let's look at them. Numbers 18, 21, and 24. You see the Levitical, the Levitical tithe, right, supporting the priests, other religious personnel. 
Deuteronomy 14, 20 through, 22 through 27, we see the annual feast tithe. In fact, they ate this tithe, the people, with the Levites. So there were some years where God said, eat the tithe. And they ate it with the Levites, seeing that it was food. It was things that they brought to them. Uh, the third year, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, verses, chapter 26, 22 through 27, they were called to give this to the poor. They were called to give this away to the poor. So the distribution was not left to the individual, but was a community project which everyone had to give to. So the tithe, therefore, was for the neighbor in that one, giving to the poor. They were giving to the neighbor. So if we had to add all these up, what was the total? Well, one third of their produce, this amounted to over 20 percent. Now, we'll take that here. I mean, you know, if you want to do that, that's awesome. So this is not including the leaving of the corners of their land for the poor to receive from as well. Well, what about first fruits? Well, God expected the Israelites to honor him by giving the first fruits of what he gave to them. That's exactly what God wanted them to do. Leviticus 27, 30 through 31. Every tenth of the land's produce, grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. If a man decides to redeem any part of his tenth, listen to what it said. If any man decides to do what? Redeem any part of it. He must add a what? A fifth to its value. You know how people come around, they talk about, oh, you know, first fruit giving, first fruit offering. Well, unless you're talking about food, you shouldn't even use that language at all. Well, what do they do with this first fruit offering? They offered it up before any of the harvest came in, the first part of the harvest, as a sign of what was to come and follow. So no matter how small, it was a symbol of God's promise and the people's hope that the rest of the harvest would follow. This is why they did it. So giving 10% or the tithe was commanded of the Israelites, and therefore it was an obligation. It wasn't, it wasn't like, I may choose to do it. It was like, no, you must do it, right? When Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the requirements of the law, and he made this idea of this 10% tithe obsolete. To continue to insist that it's still in effect is to nullify, at least in part, the sacrifice of Christ, and return to the idea of justification by works and law keeping. Now, I'm not saying everybody who teaches this is saying that. What I am saying is that that can become the logical conclusion that you're working for a blessing. Now, some people give and they're not giving in that way. I know for me personally, the way I was taught Malachi 3 and 10 was very much, it was eisegesis at the highest. Essentially, if you don't give, you're going to be cursed. But no one ever read that in context. Read Malachi 1, then 2, then 3. Why was God so upset? It's because he had a theocratic government in place, and, it, and the, the people, the priests, refused to follow his commands. The people refused to follow the Lord. And, of course, God was saying, yes, you're going to be cursed. Why? Because you're disobeying me. But who became a curse for us? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says this, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the, the supreme model giving the New Testament was not based on 10%, but 100% commitment of personal resource to the Lord. Everything. In the New Testament, it says, in the New Testament, nowhere does the New Testament require Christians to tithe in the sense of giving 10%, but it does reiterate many things associated with this, with this idea. Those who minister are entitled to receive support, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. The poor and needy should be cared for. Those who give can trust God as a source of all that's given to supply their needs, and giving should be done joyously. We see that in 2 Corinthians 9. The New Testament directs that taxes be paid to the state, which replaced Israel's theocracy, right? Here's a question for you. Do Jews tithe? Honest question. Where's the temple? But there is no temple. There is no temple to bring anything to. You see what I'm saying? There is no temple. The temple is gone. There is no temple. It was destroyed in 70 A.D., so what do we look at? Well, Paul's vocabulary and teaching suggests that giving is voluntary and that there's no set percentage. 
following the example of Christ, who gave his life, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, we should cheerfully give as much as we have decided, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, based on how much the Lord has prospered us, according to 1 Corinthians 16, 2, knowing that we reap in proportion to what we sow, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and that we will ultimately give an account for our deeds, Romans 14, 12. So Hebrews 7 through 10, Hebrews 7, 1 through 10, first, this entire passage shows us that it is Christ who is superior to angels. His priesthood was superior to Melchizedek's, which means he is superior to the, the Levitical priesthood as well. So Christians should give generously to the local churches, to the poor. However, a mandated 10%, it just can't be proved from Hebrews 7, nor the New Testament. Hebrews 7, 1 through 10 provides the theological undergirding to demonstrate the superiority of Christ's sacrifice over the Mosaic law sacrifice that Jesus died for our sins once and for all. So New Testament Christians give an offering to the Lord. We give monetarily, we give with our lives, and we know that God doesn't need our money. Yes, we know that. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We recognize that. But we give cheerfully. We give freely to the Lord. So to prove tithing from the New Testament a passage has to be produced that has its primary purpose of advocating tithing. You see what I'm saying? Something has to be proved that advocates that this is what you're commanded to do. It has to be, hey, here's an imperative. Remember in the book of Acts when they had the Jerusalem council? Did we find anything in there of them commanding the early Christians from that point to do this? No. Now, I already know people in their head. You got a couple of things swirling in your head. Well, what are people going to give? One, you should be giving intentionally to the Lord as God prospers you. This is how most people come to church. Oh, I'm going, I showed up at church. Oh, wait, they're going to give him? God. Here's $5. That is haphazard, right? You knew for six whole days you were going to show up here on a Sunday. The Apostle Paul said, look, at the first day of the week, set aside what to give to the Lord, right? For many of us, we need to say, am I intentionally looking at what I have, and am I giving to the Lord as he's prospered me? Now, if you and your, and your self say, you know what, I am going to budget 10% of my income to give to the Lord, do it. But do it with the understanding you're doing it freely, not under compulsion or being commanded to do it, right? Why am I saying this? It's because there are many Christians who have been taught that if you give this magical 10%, then you're going to like, you know, the, the canker worm is not going to come on you. Your washing machine is not going to break and, you know, stuff like that. I want to say there are many Christians who live in fear of a couple of things. One, the rapture, and two, if they don't give right. Many Christians live in cowering fear of a God that he, he, I don't know where this God is. I know people manufactured him from here. Am I saying you shouldn't give to the Lord? No, I'm saying you should give to the Lord. In fact, I would say a movement of the Holy Spirit is a generous people. We see it in Acts as they gave and laid at the apostles' feet. We see Ananias and Sapphira actually being destroyed for lying. And guess what? Nobody forced them to give what they were given. What I'm saying to each one of us is we need to check our hearts and say, Lord, am I giving freely? I know a person right now that, and again, I'm not saying you should be diligent in your giving, right? If you say, you know what, this is the first thing check I want to write, or man, I've set up uh, recurring giving in that way, you should do all those things. But I know a person, and if, they, if this is not the first check they write, they all are under condemnation. And they fall into this condemnation, and then they walk around and feel like God doesn't love them, they're cursed, or uh, something bad happens with their finance, they make a bad finance. See, that's because I didn't give my first, the first thing I got. Y'all, that is living under a, a, a pressure that Christ has set us free from. I get a lot of pushback on this, and I do. I get pastors telling me this all the time. If you don't teach your people that they got to give 10% up front, they're not going to give. What happened in the book of Acts? Spirit-filled people are compelled by the Spirit of God to be generous 
to the things of God. We look for spirit-filled people to all they do is, you don't think about it. We've relegated the work and power of the Holy, Holy Spirit to, to a few things. Tongues, um, healings, signs and wonders. What happened to the work of the Holy Spirit that, that teaches us the things of Jesus Christ? Call, convicts us of sin, leads us to generosity. And this is what New Testament giving is all about. Giving freely to the Lord. Here's another thing. People will say, man, you know, so you're just telling people they shouldn't give. What? We're actually teaching the exact opposite. We're saying you should be so intentional with your giving that you're looking at what you have and saying, am I utilizing all my funds to the glory of God? The one thing I know I'm guilty of as a sin that I, 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 you know, I was talking to the Lord about this the other day. You get this subscription here, get this subscription there, subscription, and you just forget about it. Next thing you look up, you got a hundred some dollars coming out. And then you're like, a hundred dollars going out? I'm not even using this stuff. Well, I could take that and maybe say, you know what? As a, I met with a missionary couple the other day. They left their home, left their corporate job. They're in Orlando. They're doing mission work towards uh, pastors and their wives. They do these things called Weekend to Remember. And they're 100%, like, whatever people give, that's what they live off of. I, we spent a whole hour on the phone with them. And I got on that phone. I said, Lord, it would be a shame if we do not support these people. He said, how are you going to support them? Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to look at my budget. I'm going to say, what frivolous spending do I have? And it's a lot. It's not that this is sinful, but it's like, am I using my resources for the glory of God? You say, well, you pay by the church. You give to the church. Yeah, I give to the church. This is the church I'm a part of. I'm a sheep here as well, right? Giving to the Lord. All right, let me keep going. Here's the last one. All right, here's the last one. Here's the last one. God would rather you be cold towards him than lukewarm. All right. I don't know if I can get through all this, but let's look at it. Revelation 3, 14, 18. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. We probably heard that preach a bazillion times, and oftentimes it's always talking about being on fire for God, and the lukewarm person is on the fence. But is that what it's saying? No. So people may refer to someone as being cold today as lacking passion or affection. Now, the word is never used that way in the Old Testament. However, it, does, it, does, it appears to have occurred frequently uh, used in the first century outside the New Testament, this idea of being cold. So the word cold doesn't occur much in the Bible. So when we say someone, was, or someone is hot, we could mean they're angry. It could mean it's summertime and their temperature is up. Right. Or they, you know, some people say, well, they're hot. They're on fire for God. Yet, remember, we have to look at would it would it when John wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what did the first century church get? And did they understand what he was saying? So when we look at the use of the word hot, even in their early church, we don't find any references for hot that mean being on fire for God. OK, so one Greek dictionary states that hot never referred to a favorable attitude towards someone. The Greek word for lukewarm means between hot and cold. So the background uh, for these words are found in understanding the aqueduct system in Laodicea. This city was formed uh, and it became, it was at the center of, uh, of these trade routes. So that's how the city was formed. So Laodicea didn't have any natural water supply. Now remember, he's writing to this church. So that means this church would have understood exactly what he was saying. So it didn't have a natural water supply. Therefore, they had to pipe water in from a nearby city. Now, this city is known today as the modern city of Denzali. Denzali had a hot spring and was located about six miles south of Laodicea. So the Laodiceans constructed an aqueduct, right? And you can see these when you go to Israel today. You see the aqueduct system is still, you know, many systems still there that they ran water through that. So it ran from Denzali to Laodicea and it provided water for the citizens. 
Now, they had a nearby city that they had their own water, seas, uh, water sources. So six miles north of Laodicea was a city of Hierapolis, which was known for its hot spring. So these springs were known for their healing qualities. It's always going to come into play. Twelve miles east of Laodicea, right, there was a city there that was known for its pure and refreshing drinking water. So we have two cities, one known for their hot springs for healing, another one that was piping in hot water, one that was known for their pure and refreshing water. So this water came down from the snowy caps of Mount Cadmus, and the cold, life-giving water at Colossae explains why people originally settled there. So someone could stand in Laodicea and look towards Colossae and see the mountain caps that provided all the cold water. You guys ever been so hot where you got a drink of water and it was, the, it, was the mo- it was the best thing you ever had in your entire life, right? So cold could actually mean something positive, correct? Okay. So this idea, as it talks about in the scripture there, this reference of vomiting or spitting out of his mouth, what is John talking about here? What is the example he's using? Water. That's the example. He's talking about water here. Right? So he's referencing this idea of water. That's what he's talking about. So the people of Laodicea, right, they heard hot, cold water, right? They were thinking about the water from Colossae, the water from Hierapolis, right? That's what in, that w- would have been in their minds. But both of these were good. The hot was good and the cold was good. So in Revelation 3, hot does not refer to being on fire for the Lord, but being spiritually Uh, healing, right? We talk about those healing waters that they believe that were there, right? This idea of being uh, spiritually whole and healthy. Cold doesn't refer to being against God. Instead, cold refers to being spiritually refreshing, to be a life-giving church. And that's the point he was making to them, right? Both of these are good. Cold and hot are good, right? Because that's what we should be. Spiritually refreshing, bringing healing, but also, man, making sure that we're a life-giving body to the glory of God. Well, what about lukewarm? Well, when the water from Denzali reached Laodicea, it was no longer hot, but it often was lukewarm. So the citizens, they would take the water, put it in jars, set it to the side because it would often be still warm. But what would happen is visitors would often come, take a drink of that, and because they weren't used to it, thinking it was going to be cold, they would spit it out. But not only that, if a visitor did drink it, because of the minerals, as one commentator said, because of the calcium carbonate in the water, it would upset their stomach and they would vomit out the water. So what does he say? I know your works. So right here, it's, it's talking about, it's telling us about it right there, right? It's not about faith or being cold towards God or on fire for God. This letter is written to a church about their actions, and these actions then are evident of their attitude. So cold and hot are positive, while lukewarm is negative. So the hot water stands for that spiritual, spiritual healing that a church should be bringing. The cold refers to those uh, being spiritually refreshed or life-giving. And the lukewarm water refers to those who are lacking in those good works. So this does not mean hot on fire for the Lord or cold against the Lord uh, or lukewarm as your fence sitting, right? But we're called as a church to be zealous for good works and our love for him should overflow into our lives. Amen? All right, I threw a whole bunch at you. All right, I'm done. Questions, anybody? Okay, all in it back. I don't, I don't really have a question. I just want to acknowledge that I appreciate the way you broke down the Revelation text. I had a brother in Christ explain it to me, and that's how he explained it. It made more sense instead of the, you know, hot and cold being on fire. And yeah, you have to, yeah. You have to understand the historical context. I appreciate you for bringing it to the light. Amen. Yeah. It preaches good. <laughs> it does, man. They're like, man, get fire. You better be cold for the Lord. You better be on fire. Troy Gloss was here as a guest speaker. 
Yep. You that with us. Don't worry. That's, that's, I just got on the phone with him. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't know much about geography at all. And so when Troy Gauss broke it down, that was the first time I heard it. Mm-hmm. That is so... It just really relates because we yeah. can visualize this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's good. It's awesome. Or anybody else? Anybody else? All right. All right. So unless there are no questions, we're going to wrap it up. All right? We're going to wrap it up. All right. So remember, next week we'll have prayer, all right, prayer, uh, we'll have prayer at six, uh, and then we won't have uh, this directly after, but the following week, we'll kick back up with a new series uh, called God and Money. Uh, we're going to be walking through a lot of good stuff, so if you have money questions, you have stuff like that, anything going on with finance, uh, make sure you bring it so that we can uh, grow together to the glory of God. And um, yeah, I purposely did talk about giving right here before we talked about that, right? So uh, we want to be a generous people, right? And we want to do it in a manner that is uh, giving God glory, not under compulsion, not feeling like we're under uh, that pressure, but really to, man, we want to please the Lord with all, all of our lives and everything. Amen? All right. Well, let me pray for us and we're all done. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for this uh, Wednesday night series, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to walk through uh, so many different things, God. Uh, I thank you, Lord, that we'll be able to walk into a new series uh, in the next uh, week and a half uh, where we can grow and continue to learn uh, and to grow together as a people. Help us to be spirit-led, spirit-filled people, God, that are uh, just amazed at your love, amazed at your grace, amazed at your mercy, uh, Lord, and let your spirit Uh, Once again, fill our lives, fill our sails of our lives, God, that we, uh, Lord, are like the early church, that we are generous with our time, our resources, God. And Lord, uh, seek to reach others with the good news of Christ. Help us to be loving, compassionate, Lord, and walk the path that you've called us to walk. God, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.